access or that access to the to the workshop. So I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we we'll meet today and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, so the River to Range project uh, is funded as part of the Peri Urban uh, Weed Management Partnerships program by DELP. And we're now in our fifth year of the project, but most of the project partners also work together in previous projects as well. And most people are collaborating for around nine years. So it's like it's a really long project here. Um, so the project aims to support with, contr with control works uh, by providing funding to project partners and also by sharing knowledge and planning together to achieve better outcomes uh, across the landscape in with management. And I've only started uh, to work on the project a few months ago. And one of the ongoing works uh, that you guys were, were doing was around developing this management plan for emerging weeds um, in the areas. Uh, so we have this list of the of emerging weeds that were already recorded in the project areas, uh, which are, are around 20 uh, species at the moment. And my idea with this workshop was to bring this forward to help us decide like how do we want to approach them in the future, also to raise questions and concerns that the group might have regarding them and regarding the, their management. And so I'm very happy to have this chance to hear from all the project partners your ideas, your updates about what is happening in each one of the reserves as well. And so to, to, to bring this, this thing, um, I want to thank our, our three guest speakers. So we have today Graham Lorimer and also oops, sorry, Graham Lorimer and Sally Lamborn and also Brad Matthews from the OP who kindly accepted to give this the, the talks today. So as our first speakers, oh, speaker, sorry, we'll have Graham, uh, who will talk about identification and ecology uh, of emerging weeds. So Graham, he works at a consultant and give, giving trainings in the areas of botany and ecology, and he has like an extensive experience with vegetation in our area. And I'm sure like most of you are already familiar with him. So I want to pass the word to, to him now. And we'll have plenty of time for questions after the talk, but if you want to also, I don't know, type the questions in the chat as well, just so, so you cannot, uh, just so, so you won't forget the questions or something like that. So it, it also feel, feel free to type, type in the questions and we'll, we'll have time for this after the talk. So, Graham? Okay, thank you, Ellie. Um, Everyone, uh, when Ellie asked me uh, if I could run a session on identification and ecology of emerging weeds, I thought, oh, that's a great thing to be doing in springtime in person out in the bush. And of course, it's not in the bush and it's not in person and it's not in springtime. So that limits what I can do in those respects. I will do some, but um, Many of you know me already and you won't be surprised to learn that I thought an important aspect of what I could pass on to you today is information about how to approach weed problems and then put uh, the particular weed species on the list into context. So um, what I'm going to start with is talking about some underlying principles of how to deal with weeds so that we can then talk about uh, how each individual species might be approached, partly for identification, but also for, um, for you to get a better understanding of how it might behave and how you might respond to that. Um, and an important part of that, I think, is maintaining a high degree of objectivity, which I often find is lacking in the area of prioritisation and dealing with uh, weeds. And that very word weed, it sort of grates with me a little bit. It's a very useful practical term, but um, it's one of those weed, uh, words which, when I hear it, it raises alarm bells about exactly what somebody means when they use it. To miss quote William Shakespeare, a name, a name, what's in a name? 
a weed by any other name could smell quite different because a, the term weed is not a category of a plant. It is a, a, a word like rival that explains not just the subject of the word, but also the object, that is the attitude that the person has uh, to the subject. So when we talk about a weed, we are implicitly making a value judgment about its worth to us and that we don't want it. So uh, a species like blackberry is a weed that you can reasonably say that if you don't want it. Uh, however, it has some wonderful redeeming features from a botanical and biological point of view. When we call it a weed, it's a good utilitarian sort of term for it, but we need to keep in mind that it isn't the property of the plant. Uh, blackberry, for example, has its own natural habitat and it performs very important environmental functions in that natural habitat. So when we use the term weed, we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that anything that somebody, somebody else calls a, a species a weed, it doesn't mean that it's going to be a weed in every context, um, or sometimes even in any context at all in my experience. So I'm raising this not as just a pedantic matter, but because it can influence how you go about um, managing and prioritising weeds. And uh, rather than be caught up with the term weed or weed of national significance or that sort of stuff, I think it's important to keep in mind the context of a particular population of a species and how that's behaving and what it's doing. And that should guide your prioritisation of that species or that population, not the species as a whole, but that particular population, um, and how you might go about dealing with it, or even deciding that it's not worth dealing with at all. And uh, these things can be applied to emerging weeds as well. Uh, let me just check my notes. Um, that will do. Now I'm going to try sharing my screen now. Um, and that would be with this button he here. And if I go to um, here. Now, um, Ellie, can you confirm for me that you're seeing uh, a screen headed considerations for prioritization? Yep, good. OK, let me show that bigger. Um, uh, I've, I've spent a bit of time thinking about how to go about categorising weed problems. And it seems to me that if you are working out the priority uh, for dealing with a particular problem of weeds in a particular situation, there are these five things I've identified that are important considerations. And I'm going to look at each of the species on the emerging uh, weeds list for your area uh, in terms of these different things. Uh, the first thing that comes up is quite naturally how serious the weed is, uh, and I'm using that term weed all the time, but you know what I mean, uh, the seriousness of the particular species in what it's doing um, in terms of either environmental impact, agricultural impact, cultural impact, all those sorts of adverse impacts. And one thing uh, that I would tie up with that, and which is all too often ignored, is this concept of the spectrum of plants and animals between ecological passengers and drivers of change. Uh, for those of you who haven't come across this concept before, it's um, pretty well established now in ecological um, circles that um, when a new species is introduced to an environment, they can be drivers of ecological change in, in Nilambic and surrounding areas. Sweet Potosporum would be a good example of that. Or well, Blackberry can be a driver as well. Uh, when, it, when it arrives, it actually causes environmental change as opposed to being a passenger 
uh, where a passenger is more a symptom of the change that has already occurred by other means. Uh, so we have a range of species of plants which turn up in very disturbed environments where the ecology uh, has completely changed and these introduced plants will establish because the, the pre-existing indigenous species are no longer able to persist. And that could be even as a result of things that happened over a century ago. So uh, I'm saying now that it's really important to keep in mind when you look down a list of plant species like our emerging weed lists, whether the whether each of those particular species behaves in Nilambic as a likely driver of ecological change, or is really just riding on the coattails of environmental change that has been caused by uh, prior um, things going on, or whether it's somewhere in the middle. And in many cases, it's very hard to tell. Um, and if I had time, uh, which would need more than an hour, I, I would go through how you might be able to determine uh, whether a species is more a passenger and driver, but I will acknowledge that it can be extremely difficult. Those of you who are practitioners in the field and who, who, who have spent years working on vegetation management, we have a, a good gut feel for which species are, are passengers and which ones are drivers. But uh, it's important to keep that in mind when you're working out how serious a weed is and how to respond to it. Number two on my list is the rate of spread, how, uh, how rapidly you expect the particular population of this introduced species to, um, to spread and cause worsening problems. And that's of particular importance for emerging weeds. Um, we have introduced plant species turning up um, year by year. I spend a bit of time with my colleague Val Stasek at the Royal Botanic Gardens um, monitoring what new uh, species are turning up naturalised. Often they're just in gardens, sometimes they'll get into the bush, sometimes the ones that get into the bush don't do anything, sometimes they have disastrous consequences. Um, so uh, anyway, no, number two is that we need to consider how quickly they will spread. Sometimes we know a fair bit about that and there are people who spend their lives working out just what sort of uh, rate of spread we can expect from an introduced plant species based on its ecological requirements and all that sort of stuff. Number three is um, we sometimes have to take into account what positive values a plant that we might call a weed have for purposes like um, the heritage value of a hawthorn hedge. So they're protected. Uh, um, hawthorn hedges uh, older than a certain age um, used to be, perhaps no longer are, but certainly used to be excluded as uh, noxious weeds. Similarly, pine trees uh, that have particular heritage value, landscape uh, issues. So in, in Manningham, for example, pine trees and park orchards are protected even where they're acting as serious environmental weeds because it's regarded as a pine area and it's part of the heritage of the area and it's important landscape. Point four on my list is attractability. This is a really important one and you'll see it come up on our list of priority weeds. Tractability is how well you could expect to uh, control or eradicate the particular weed problem, taking into account uh, not just whether you've got the right herbicide or technique, but also whether it's safe um, whether there are environmental hazards, uh, for example, around water, spraying around water, all those sorts of things go into tractability. And the last thing is legal obligations. And I'm sure all of you people are familiar with obligations under the Catchment and Land Protection Act in particular. Um, so they are the um, important uh, considerations that I've identified. Now, I'm not sure that I can see whether there are any questions that people want to ask at this point before I go on to talking about how you can apply these things using a triage matrix. Ellie, I can see you. Are there any questions that I ought to be taking now? Uh, not so far, Grim. 
Good o. Then oh, no, I will... no, we do have. So okay. Here, What's Karen, that? Just raise her hand. Yeah, I have. I don't know if it's a question or just a comment, but I've often struggled. Legal obligations often don't seem to come into play with new and emerging weeds because they're not listed yet. That's always a tricky one. Yes, that, that, that's true. It doesn't stop you dealing with them other than that sometimes they won't be on label if you want to use a herbicide, which may be the best technique to control them. Um, so it's not something that will limit what you do, but some, sometimes um, having a species listed forces you to deal with uh, species which aren't really deserving of that level of priority. For example, in Parks Victoria and Nillimbic Council, you've got really limited resources. You really do have to prioritise things well. That's why I've come up with this stuff about the things you need to consider and the triage matrix that I'm about to show you. And um, uh, sometimes the, the legal obligations force you to spend a lot of money controlling BlackBerry or something like that when the BlackBerry problems that exist might be of very low importance in many of these other criteria. I hope that deals with it. Is that all right? Yes, thank you. Good. I'll move on because there's so much to deal with. OK, um, I mentioned this idea of a triage matrix. Now, and you'll see on the bottom of the screen, uh, a reference to a paper from, and I can't read the date because I've got something blocking it off. Uh, yeah, anyway, um, it doesn't have the date. Oh yeah, 2010. Um, I've adapted it a little bit, and I did this specifically for environmental weeds, but it can apply to agriculture or other cir circles as well. And um, to start off with, I suggest you have a look on the left-hand side of the screen, where it says level of threat to biodiversity, it could be to agriculture or whatever. And that needs to take into account both the magnitude of the impact at the moment and also the likelihood of it spreading and the seriousness that that rate of spread might cause. So that's the first thing you take into account and you decide whether your particular um, weed problem lies in the low, medium or high category. So it's just a qualitative, subjective sort of thing. So this isn't all entirely objective, but um, you start off with that. The next thing you do is you look along the top where it talks about the tractability, uh, and that takes into account um, adequacy of your technique, maybe your chemicals, but also safety, environmental values, and that sort of stuff. And again, we rank the tractability of your problem according to high, medium and low. And uh, you can see in the nine soils in the middle there, the white ones, that it will lead you to different points. For example, if a particular um, introduced plant is rated as high on its level of threat and rate and or rate of spread, and rate of spread is one that's really important for emerging reed, weeds, because it may not be a serious threat where it happens to be at the moment, as in the case of um, Hyperinia herta, Kulatai grass, when it turned up uh, out at kangaroo ground. You wouldn't have said it was high on the seriousness in that particular context, but the potential for rate of, head, rate of spread was high, so we would have put it in this category. Tractability, it was a small infestation um, and uh, safe to control beside the road. Um, so uh, it had high tractability, so it came out with this rating A. Weed management is critical, immediate, targeted and long term. Uh, similarly, if you went to the opposite ends of the spectrum, then you end up in the bottom right of the table with no immediate action. So that is how the triage matrix works in that context. But the department also produced back in 2012, this thing called a post-fire weeds triage manual, uh, sorry, Parks Victoria and Department of Sustainability and Environment. I don't have time to go through it all. It's designed for post Black Saturday. Uh, so it deals with some stuff which is specific to fires, such as 
um, the desirability of controlling broom species and course following a fire once the uh, seed bank uh, is stimulated to all germinate. But the majority of this manual is actually quite relevant in um, all respects. I don't have time to go through it in much detail. I'll leave you to look it up. If you can just remember post fire weeds triage manual and um, I'll provide a link to it to Ellie uh, if she's circulating other stuff and I'll offer you another document presently as well. Anyway, if I just scan through it quickly, um, it's more objective than the triage manual that I've just shown you. Um, it goes through steps that are analogous and it uses the same five criteria. Um, if not all five of them, I can't remember whether it includes legal obligations, but at any rate, when I read through it, I thought, um, and I, I discovered this after I produced that other triage manual, I thought, crikey, they've come up with the same criteria um, and go about it in the same sort of way as I've been doing, which was encouraging. Anyway, uh, the first thing to do is to select what target plant you're talking about and to help you go through a more objective process. At the end of it, there is a list of um, a gosh awful sized list of um, introduced plants in Victoria. And it includes most of the ones on the emerging weeds list for your area. Uh, and it tells you the group of weeds that it occurs in, such as, uh, well, let's find a relevant one here, um, Anagallis arvensis. It's not an emerging weed, but uh, it's a local weed. Um, Pimpernel, it's uh, in the weed group, small, control, impracticable. Um, and there's a, effectively a footnote. It tells you at the top of the table what a one means in that column. And that is then used in the triage process in the earlier part. And it comes out telling you basically what sort of priority uh, to put into uh, the uh, control of that particular weed. And in that case, for Anagallis arvensis, now called Lysomachia arvensis, you wouldn't do anything about it. Um, so there is another objective way of going about dealing with weeds. Now, um, with that basis, I think we can now have a look at the uh, individual species on the list. Uh, he says, trying to find the list. The list is somewhere. Uh, crikey, I've forgotten where it's gone. Um, I thought I had everything lined up in a row. Let me just do this better. Give me a moment. I'm sorry about this. I can send you again the list if you want to. Uh, I, I just don't know where it's gone. Um, I can. OK, oh, look, here it is. That's going to involve me swapping over. It's going to be more efficient if I just do this. Ellie, are there questions that I can uh, deal with um, whilst I'm fiddling around with this? Questions in your Not for now. OK, then pressure's on me to get this done really fast. Right now, um, Ellie, can you confirm for me, please, that you're seeing your list slightly modified form and with some stuff in it? Yep, I'm seeing Good. it. OK, uh, then we are back on track then. Um, here is uh, the list that Ellie sent me of the emerging weeds. I've ordered them in a more logical fashion for this talk, uh, so I've put all the grass weeds together and so on. Um, and it'll fit more neat into a neater sequence. I've also put at the top of this list uh, the five criteria by which to judge the weeds. And 
The first one that you can see on the list is uh, what was printed on the list originally is Pinkwood Sorrel. The more recognised name for it is Fingerleaf Wood Sorrel. I prefer that one because, as you'll see when I show you the pictures of it, um, that it is uh, recognisable by its um, leaf shape. Um, now, uh, in fact, I'll go straight to the pictures. Here are the pictures that I got just doing a DuckDuckGo search for images of Oxalis glabra. And you can see by the, the larger picture there that the leaflets were in, in the, that classic um, um, trifoliate structure with three leaflets in each leaf. Unlike other wood sorrels or oxalis species, each leaflet is long and slender, uh, hence finger leaf oxalis or wood sorrel. So that's how I would suggest you identify this species in the wild. There are a number of wood sorrels or oxalis species that um, have these bright, showy pink flowers with yellow throats. Uh, for example, oxalis purpurea. Uh, it's a beautiful looking thing. The flower is very similar to this, but it has big leaves, more typical in shape of the shamrock sort of shape of of leaf. Now, um, I'm expecting that most or all of you already know about the Vic Flora website, and it has some very useful information about, um, well, particularly about emerging weeds. Um, uh, if you're not used to Vic Flora, just Google Vic Flora, it'll come up straight away. And at the top right, you can see that there's something for enter taxon name up there. And if you were to put in fingerleaf wood sorrel or oxalis glabra, uh, it'll quickly take you to this page. And it shows that it's only recognised as being uh, found in this small area to the north of Melbourne, uh, where it's naturalised. Some of these maps are a bit out of date, but they're not bad. One of the most important things that lead me to draw your attention to uh, the Vic flora treatments of all these species. I might try enlarging it a bit so that you can read it better. Um, after a boffin's description of what the species is like, it tells you where it grows to. Uh, in this case, it's native to the Cape Province in South Africa. Then here's the important stuff locally common in weedy mowing slash nature strips and in degraded grassland on basalt clays at Craigie, Craigie Burn. Also noted from degraded eucalyptus camelgiolensis woodland at Somerton. Um, now for a species that's still um, so uh, isolated in its distribution, we're not getting a lot of ecological information, but we are learning from this that it is found principally on basalt and on the Victorian volcanic plains. And that says a lot about uh, where it might turn up in Nillimbik or in the Parks Victoria estate in and around Nillimbik. You're going to expect it more likely to occur on the basalt, although given that it's uh, only just in recent times uh, turned up in the wild at all, um, that might be uh, a poor indication. Um, Anyway, I thought I would draw that uh, to your attention. For identification, I think the thing is see it in flower and, and you'll see bright showy flowers. That might be what attracts you to it. Um, the pink flowers with the yellow throat are uh, narrowed down to one of a group of oxalis, but it's the only one that has those finger-shaped um, tri trifoliate, well, finger-shaped finger leaflets in the trifoliate leaves. Um, now, um, how do we rate that in terms of the five criteria? I thought I'd use this one as an example of how you'd go about doing, uh, using these criteria. Firstly, the seriousness uh, of the adverse impacts taking into account the passenger driver spectrum. We really can't tell at the moment other than that it doesn't seem to have really spread very much yet. So the seriousness is a bit of an unknown quantity, but um, it's probably not huge. Um, secondly, the expected rapidity of the problem worsening. Well, we've 
got a few years under our belt since uh, since it first turned up. And uh, unless somebody can disabuse me, um, I think uh, it still hasn't spread very much. So um, uh, it's not spreading very rapidly, um, but it might do. And we've got to take that into account. The third point is what positive values does it, does the species have? For example, heritage it doesn't have those sorts of values. Of course, it was brought in because it's a showy plant for gardens. So it has positive values in a garden, um, in agriculture, in uh, the natural environment. I can't think of any positive values it would have. Tractability. Um, it's uh, it's a geophyte, uh, so it's amenable to the same sorts of treatments, I think, as um, the other uh, oxalis species are. So we can deal with that without too much difficulty, I think. Whilst it's still small infestations, it's extremely tractable, I would say, unless it happens to be intermingled with the last population of a rare orchid or something like that. So tractability, I would expect, if you were to find any of this species, would be high. And I think there are no legal obligations, and, and that's where we have a look down on the table here. I take it back. Um, it might not be a legal obligation, but we do have this uh, indication that it's on the CMA's new and emerging weed list. Now, let me just check how we're going for time. Yep, um, I, I, I always know I've got to hurry up. Um, now, are there any questions before I move on, Ellie? Good. OK, I will press on then. Uh, and uh, that brings us to um, the other Oxalis species, Oxalis micrantha. How do you identify it? Well, you will need a microscope. You will need to spend quite some time sifting through specimens at the National Herbarium of Victoria, and you'll need to be a very proficient botanist. Now, this photograph was taken by Val Stasek. This is on the Vic Flora website. Uh, and I didn't show you with uh, the previous Oxalis, but uh, I'll just press the escape button. And on Vic Flora, as well as having the sort of page and information that I showed you before, which you can see here, um, Vic Flora is, for most species, the best um, collection of photos. Now, there are a range of these yellow flowering creeping or um, dense uh, ground cover species. Um, and uh, there are some of them which we, Val and I, have not yet identified. Val's been working on them. I've put in some specimens of some un, um, unidentifiable species. Um, they're not a recognised species or a species known to occur in Australia. So there are quite a few species. This particular one, Oxalis micrantha, is now recognised and given a name. The other species aren't given a name, so they won't appear on your list, but they're of equal threat or lack of threat to this one. Um, because it's so hard to identify and is only recently identified, we don't know how many other uh, populations of these little yellow uh, perennial oxalis species there are around the place. Um, and this might be a moderately common species for all we know. Um, so it's sort of an emerging weed in the sense that we really, uh, well, our realisation of it is just emerging quite apart from whether it's really emerging in the environment. So I don't think I can say much more about that one. I'll keep moving on. If you've got questions about it, I'll take that later. Um, I do want to spend a bit of time on Disabracteata, the South African orchid, or sometimes called the African weed orchid. I saw this thing in abundance in Western Australia, uh, what would it be, eight or ten years ago, before it was recognised to have come into Victoria. Um, and I could see the trajectory of the thing and that it was inevitable that it would get across to the Pacific coast um, because there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, it produces copious weeds, uh, seeds, um, and it's, well, let, uh, let me uh, just go through the photographs that are on the Vic Flora website. It has a tuba, as uh, most orchids do. Um, it's pretty readily identifiable in this state with the brown and yellow flowers. 
Um, for those of you who know the broom rapes, it looks a lot like that, particularly in its dead state. I don't think there's a photograph here of it dead, but uh, uh, it's not wanting to reshow the photographs. Uh, at any rate, uh, Disabracteata, um, we should have a look at in regard to these five criteria, um, because I might differ to how it appears on the list here. Um, you, so first thing, seriousness of the adverse impacts, taking into account the passenger driver spectrum. Well, it's definitely not a real passenger because it can move into fairly uh, intact native vegetation, although it does prefer um, disturbed vegetation. You'd read that in the Vic flora treatment as well. Um, so it, it certainly has the potential to be very serious, particularly for displacing orchids. And of course, that's our most threatened uh, family of plants locally in the state, in the nation and across the world. Um, so it does pose a significant risk. You've got to take it seriously. So that would rate it high in priority. But the next thing we've got to have a look uh, at is the expected rapidity of the problem worsening. It's extreme. It goes a few hundred kilometres a year. And because it has those dust like seeds, it hasn't got to New Zealand yet, and I don't think it has, it's likely to get there across the Tasman Ocean through windblown seed. Um, point three, what positive values does it have? Don't know of any, so we'll scratch that. Tractability, here's where it all falls down. It's totally intractable. Um, I mean, you can deal with a, a, an individual infestation if you want to call use that value laden term infestation. If there are just one or two, you can get rid of them. And I know people do that. Um, but it, it's really just causing a delay in uh, the or temporary reprieve because the windblown seed will get there in another year anyway. So if there's suitable habitat, it will get back there. So it's tractable in the short term, but not at all tractable in the long term. Um, so that's where it all falls down. Therefore, high priority to eradicate. Well, as I say, you can eradicate one infestation, but it's only going to be extremely temporary. Uh, the rate of spread is just phenomenal. Now, um, that may raise some people's ire or concern. So perhaps, Ellie, I'll take any questions or comments on that particular one now. This is a, a hot issue, and uh, it's probably best if we discuss it now. Hi, Graham. Hello, Hi, Steph. So the last financial year, so we thought we would put a fair bit of oomph towards um, Deza um, in Nilambic last spring. We um, spent a decent amount of money on um, invest, uh, searching about 15 property, private properties, sent letters to people, said, we suspect it's on your property, we'd like to search to get a better picture of where it is. Um, uh, and that's alongside controlling existing known infestations and work on roadsides. So given that it is a high priority, but then you're, I'm getting a sense that you're, or you also, also think we're kind of doomed, what is your professional recommendation for how we proceed? Um, this is a classic case of prioritisation, isn't it? Um, you, there may be circumstances in which you really do want to uh, control it um, in or near a high significant site, particularly if it's a site for the sort of plants that might compete with Disabracteata, those being orchids, and of course Nilambic's known for its orchids, um, then you might want to do something about it. Um, if it's distant from any such uh, situation, um, I'm not surprised that you use terms like, as you did, about the amount of money that you can spend on searching for it and controlling it. I'm thinking it might be best to concentrate your efforts where you might have some hope of um, minimising the population and doing follow-up, because whilst you wouldn't have 
necessarily much follow up from the plants that were there in the past. There will always be seeds blowing in. The, as I say, the thing spreads hundreds of kilometres each year. Um, so you've got to expect that it's going to come back. So it's just a matter of tailoring your uh, response to uh, your budget and what you expect this species might do. And if it's on a private property, uh, far from a conservation um, site, um, and if it's going to cost a lot of money, then you're probably better off putting that money into uh, dealing with the species in situations where it really does pose a higher threat. Okay, so your suggestion is we should be shifting to more an asset-based protection now, then? I, I, I think so, Steph. I'd appreciate other people's views, Parks Victoria um, in particular, because it must be a really high priority uh, for things like or places like Warrandyte State Park with all of its orchids. What do other people think? Kerrily? Um, yeah, it's something that we're grappling with at the moment. We had the unfortunate circumstance of finding a hundred of them and they had flowered and seeded before we found them. And so we're now at the point where we're thinking, well, it's not near one of our orchid plots. It's in an area of X pasture. Uh, the only assets up there are the large river red gum. So do we bother even to go back and check the site this year? It's really tough. What do we prioritise? Mm. It's always like that in Parks Victoria, isn't it? <laughs> All right, um, shall I move on then? Um, I was just going to ask one question, Graham. Mm -hmm. It's Kathy. Hello, Kathy. Hello. Um, we only have very limited quantities in, well, I'm only aware of two locations at the moment. But one of those is in Dominey Reserve on the edge of the 100 acres, which obviously is one of our uh, highest priority conservation areas and one of our largest reserves in Manningham. So, um, we were presuming we would put a big effort into that this year. It was only discovered last year. Would you agree that that's worth doing? I think it is on the basis that it sounds like it's um, of a scale that can be dealt with um, without large amounts of money or effort. You, you don't need to do the monitoring because you already know it's there. Um, so it's a matter of whether the benefit you get from uh, removing it justifies the the time, effort, and money in doing so. You know, if it's just a, a manageable sized um, occurrence, then yes, I think it's sensible to do that. Um, but realizing that uh, the habitat's obviously suitable for the species, and the seeds are continually falling down on us every summer. Uh, right across um, well, practically all of Victoria now. So uh, it's likely to come back again um, and could well turn up elsewhere in Dominey uh, Reserve uh, 100 acres in future. So deal with it now, but don't think that it's gone once and for all. It's bound to come back, I think. Take that on board. Thank you. Shall we move on? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, next species is, uh, well, I've got some some uh, bulb species in a group here. There's a yellow flag iris. Um, identification, let me just move over to where that is. Uh, in flower, it's really obvious. It's, a, it's the species that grows on the banks of the Yarra River or sometimes still water. Um, very showy. Uh, it's the species you'll find in those pictures of Kenneth Graham's uh, book, some book of wind in the willows, with ratty and mole on the on the on the river. You see the um, the illustrations of this species, so it's very showy. Um, uh, it's uh, let's think of it. I, I won't go through all five points on the list, but there are a few. Look, first we better do identification when it's not flowering. It looks like an iris and it lives at the edge of the water. Um, there won't be too many other things that you can confuse it with. Uh, but if you really want to go out looking for it as a preemptive sort of strike, then 
uh, you'd go out during flowering season, um, which I think is around October. Kathy, help me. What what month would you expect to see the Iris Udicorus in full flower? Yes, 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 mid to late, mid to late spring. Yep. Okay. Um, good. Um, now let's think about it in terms of some of those things that would determine how you would deal with it. Um, uh, rate of spread. Well, when it's in a stream like the Yarra River, of course, the seeds are always washing downstream. So, yes, the, the rate of spread could be great, except that it's already done that. It's already got all the way downstream. In another situation, like on the Plenty River or, or uh, what's uh, Watson's Creek. Uh, anyway, a particular stream, if you find a new infestation, then you need to consider the rate of spread. Tractability, well, I know that, uh, well, Kathy, for one, has been in a canoe, as I recall, uh, getting rid of this thing. Um, so tractability is an issue. Kathy, you can speak to tractability much better than I can. Can you say something about dealing with this thing in the wild? Uh, yeah, I think um, Melbourne Water and Parks Vic actually had great success through the um, Oh, late 90s and early 2000s and had pretty much got rid of it along large sections of the Yarra. Um, but um, it's certainly back now. But I think that with persist with enough persistence, you can control it quite well. Good. Thank you, Cathy. Um, now, uh, on the Vic Flora website, it, it tells you where it's native to. It says a vigorous weed species which occasionally escapes from gardens and colonises ditches and banks of water courses. That's just an example of the sort of information that Vic Flora can provide you with. Uh, the next species on the list is a pair of them, the uh, two and one leaf um, Cape tulips. Uh, being in the iris family, they're darn hard to identify, particularly to the species level, when they're not in flower. Um, so I think um, all I can coach you on in regard to identification is wait till they flower. And uh, the um, Maria flaccida um, has a flower that looks like you see in the pictures here. Um, the leaves are pretty... Um, uninspiring, not not much uh, identifiable about them, and there's only a couple of them. Um, uh, one, actually, there's only one for that, the other species, Maria miniata, the other species on the emerging weeds list is called uh, two-leaf Cape tulip, and you can see from this photograph, uh, which we can enlarge a little bit, that it's got one leaf there and another leaf there. The flowers on this species are much less spectacular. You really don't get much of a flower at all. And you also get, um, let me skip through, uh, you get these little bulbs which you can spread from as well, which is one of the things that you need to be wary of. Um, I don't think I'll say a lot more on bulb weeds unless people want to raise questions. Perhaps before I move on to the, the next species, um, I'll see if there are any questions that I should deal with now on bulb weeds. Ellie, are there any? No. Okay, I'll move Anyone? on. Move on. <laughs> Good, okay, we'll move on. Thistles, uh, I think there are from memory three thistles on the list. Um, the first one, that I put on the list is uh, Spanish artichoke or artichoke thistle, whichever we want to call it. Um, I think most of you will be familiar with this. You can't head across the basalt plain without seeing paddocks uh, that are covered with this. It has that greyish, very spiny, large uh, rosette of leaves and then puts up the extremely large showy purple flowers which produce the edible artichokes. Um, edible, except you've got to get rid of those horrible spines. So I, I think identification is really easy. Um, again, um, I'd like to mention that 
weight is not a property of a, is not a property of a species. It is uh, a, a term we use to describe a plant that's doing something that we don't want in a place we don't want it. Uh, the whole species is not uh, um, an absolute weed everywhere, and in particular in the sedimentary soil areas of Nilambic, um, this thing's never really taken off or anywhere on the sedimentary soils in the Melbourne area that I know of. Um, perhaps I can be corrected in that, but as soon as you get to the basalt, you see tons of this, and it doesn't really seem to compete very well off the basalt, which is not to say that it couldn't um, be a serious problem elsewhere. And I'm now remembering that there is some basalt up at Kangaroo Ground, isn't there? Um, but uh, Ellie, are you aware of this actually being a significant problem in Nilambic? So what I have here in, in my notes is that it was recorded in, in Plant Gorge. So yeah, it was only rec recorded in Plant Gorge, but I don't have much inf much uh, actual information. I can comment on that if you like. Uh, there's, yep. there's significant Thanks. infestations of it on some properties around Plenty Gorge in the Plenty area of Nilambic. Um, areas that don't have canopy cover, so right. just wide open paddocks. It's yes. really tough stuff. Yep, yep, that, that fits, doesn't it? Um, uh, that being on basalt, I'm assuming that you're talking about on the basalt, is that right? Is it on? Yeah, it's on the basalt side yep. of plenty and down there yep. there's basalt, yep. Okay, so that fits. So that tells you where you need to be worried about it. I, I wouldn't be so concerned on the sedimentary soils. You do find it principally in paddocks, as you've just described. So um, I would think of it as more an ag agricultural problem rather than an environmental problem, which is not to say that there are no environmental values in some heavily modified landscapes, but principally it's a, a weed of pastures, I would say. Just, um, Graham, I'll just add something there. We are getting some um, individuals popping up in Warrandyte State Park, but it's usually in areas where we've had machinery move from areas like Plenty Gorge to do slashing and things like that. So, yeah, we sort of jump on the, the individuals. Very wise. Um, uh, because it's in that sort of landscape, I don't think it's got the, the same potential at all to take off as it does on the basalt. But when you've just got one one or two plants uh, and it's easy to deal with, then the tractability puts it really high on the priority list. And uh, it's well worth doing that to, you know what they say, one year seeding, seven years weeding. To avoid the seven years weeding, you do it straight away because it's a straightforward sort of job in the sort of situation you've spoken about. Grammy, we also have like Steph, Julia, and Dominic. They they also said like so. Steph said that we have a handful in in kangaroo ground, and Julia agrees with that. So she said like we have plenty in Yarrumbat areas on basalt and some in kangaroo ground, and also Dominic. Um, he said he knows he noticed it down uh, on the bas on the basalt side of plenty as well. Yes, yeah, the basalt side of the Plenty River is where you would expect it to be mostly. Yeah, OK, um, uh, we're running out of time. Oh, yes, so I've got to get, get going. Uh, let me move on. Uh, the next species I've put on the list, I think, is the heraldic thistle or scotch thistle. I noticed that a lot of people use the name scotch thistle for what's really the spear thistle. It's often confused, as I'll demonstrate in a minute. So I thought I'd better tell you how to identify this species. Um, here is a, an excellent photograph of it showing its greyish foliage. That's one thing, quite greyish. And look at those stems. You'll see that the stems have got uh, leafy wings along them. And when you get up to the upper part of the, uh, of the stem, you can see that there are no leaves for quite some centimetres below the flower head. You do have wings on this on that flower stalk or peduncle, um, and that's an important identifying feature. As I'll demonstrate now, here is the Vic Flora pair of, of illustrations of the heraldic thistle. Here's the line drawing from the old um, printed version of the Flora Victoria, and you can see it shows the um, serrated wings 
and no leaves directly underneath the flowers. And here's their photograph. Uh-oh. I'd say that's a spear thistle, Circium vulgari. It doesn't have wings on the stem and it's got leaves right up underneath it. So that's just to highlight how even the Royal Botanic Gardens um, has slipped up on this occasion. I've sent a, a message through to Val Stasic to get that fixed. Um, so anyway, that's how you would recognise this species. I think you'd still treat it in much the same way as you're probably used to for a uh, a spear thistle, which of course is um, extremely widespread on floodplains in Nilambic. Um, because we're running out of time, I'm going to uh, go through fairly fast. Uh, the remaining thistle on the list is a variegated thistle, um, so-called because the leaves, as you can see down here, have the veins and all this reticulation white standing out against the green of the rest of the leaf. That makes it quite easy to identify, I think. Um, and when it flowers, you've got these really big spiny bracts around the base of the, um, the flower head. Um, again, I think you can treat it as with the other thistles. And that um, post-fire triage manual uh, provides good guidance on how to uh, prioritise and deal with uh, these thistle weeds. Um, next is Hyperenia herta, a grass. Um, I'll deal with several um, grass species in high velocity. Um, now, uh, it says apparently a recently, a relatively recent introduction to Victoria. Um, it's mostly been up around the Murray. Um, and once you go north of the divide, a magic thing happens with particularly grasses, but other plants too. You get a big jump in the proportion of uh, plant species, native and introduced, which use the C4 photosynthesis as opposed to C3. I don't have time to go into what that means, but basically there are two main processes um, in green plants for photosynthesis. One of them, C4, is more effective where there's more sunshine and warmth, and the other, C3, is better in cooler, less sunny conditions. Um, so south of the divide, most of our plants, native and introduced, are C3 plants. Uh, cooler type grass, which here has the erroneous name of tambuki grass, uh, that's another thing that I must get on to Val Stasic about to have fixed. Uh, tambuki grass is extremely similar to um, cooler tide grass. I know on your uh, emerging weeds list you've got the correct name, but um, uh, it's a C4 grass, um, more common north of the divide, but we've got climate change and there are a number of weed species which are C4 and are becoming much more abundant south of the divide, including in Nilambic. Um, you know, I can think of a few. I'm surprised that Erigrostis mexicana isn't on your emerging weed list because it's been absolutely ex exploding over the past few years and I think directly attributable to climate change. So Hyperenia herta is one that you can expect to be more favoured as climate change really takes hold. Um, uh, I'll just click on the illustrations to give you a quick idea of what it's like. Um, it has these really cute flower heads. It's coming. Oh, come on. There we go. Um, I don't have time to give you a, a lecture on how to identify grasses, but have a look at these cute downward pointing Vs in full flower. It's got the anthers or pollen bearing parts on each of these arms of the, uh, of the top of the stem. Initially, um, when the seed head or flower head emerges uh, from the uppermost leaf, as all grass seed heads do, um, you have this V-shaped arrangement as they uh, first emerge and then they point downwards when they're flowering. Um, and ultimately they point upwards. This is actually a mature one. So they go through those three phases. So the only other comparable thing in Nilambic would be Paspalum disticum or water cooch, which you'll find growing in water or at the edge of water. It, it 
has sort of Y-shaped tops to the stems, and that's how I would recognise this. Um, I suspect that there's probably only ever been the one outbreak or occurrence in Nilambik being at kangaroo ground on the edge of the road. I remember being asked about it and told about it, and uh, I remember a concerted effort was put into eradicating it. Cathy, you'd know about that. Uh, has there been any other occurrence in Nilambik? Ellie? Sorry. Uh, not not to my knowledge. Anyone know of any others? OK, um, then in the interest of saving time, I'll say that um, whilst it is quite possible for this thing to turn up again and you would certainly want to pounce on it straight away, I think conditions are still not quite right for it yet. But under climate change, it won't be too long, perhaps, before it presents a much greater uh, problem. Herogrostis curvula. Um, I don't think of it as being a really big problem in Nilambik. It's been around for decades and seeds would have been moving through Nilambik all the time and it hasn't really established hugely, but um, it certainly does turn up from time to time and uh, when there's a small infestation that can be economically removed, it should be. Um, it looks like this. This photograph I, I thought was uh, useful in showing the curly tips of the rather long leaves. It's a large tussock. It looks a lot like um, Poa Lab or Poa Lubulidaeri um, at first blush. And as I scroll through, um, we won't worry about that. There is the seed head. It has a characteristic leaden grey green colour to the seed head. Again, looks a bit like a Poa except with power, each of these branches would come, well, each of them, the branches come in whirls so that at each point of attachment on the central stem, you would find three, four, five individual um, branches coming from it. And on this species, you only get the one. So that would be one thing. But the other um, really important aspect is that when it's got the spikelets on it, the grain bearing parts, they have this characteristic leaden colour. Again, the spikelets look a lot like a poa, but they have that grey green colour. Um, oh, I've got to move on. Um, next are the needle grasses on the list. I'm going to send to Ellie these notes that I prepared in 2017. I think it might have been for Whittlesea Council. I can't remember. Um, but it tells you how to identify the various uh, needle grasses. Many of you will be familiar with Chilean needle grass. It's certainly by far the, the most prominent and worrying. Um, but there are these other species. You don't have lobed needle grass on your emerging weed list, which could be because it hasn't got to Nilambic yet. The main infestation in Victoria is immediately west of Nilambic, so I'd regard it as something to keep your eye out for. James Booth at City of Whittlesea is the full bottle on that. So if you wanted to investigate that further, I'd speak to James Booth. Um, it is distinguished from the other species by the so-called corona. If we look at it, the seed of one of these needle grasses, it's got the shaft of the, the spear, if you like, and then it's got the spearhead. And there's this uh, thing that's called a corona, which is, uh, Ellie, you might know this in Latin languages, a corona is a crown, so it looks a bit like a crown in all the species except the lobed needle grass where it doesn't really have a corona. The corona has evolved into this big flap of um, tan coloured tissue. Um, and look, really, when they're not in flower, the needle grasses are really hard to identify and I'm out of time, so I'm going to skip over the rest of the needle grasses. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, serrated tussock is another nacella. Um, again, this is like um, the artichoke thistle or Spanish artichoke in that it is um, in our part of Victoria, principally a species of the basalt soils. It does spread around Nilambic and um, other areas on the sedimentary soils. Usually I don't see it really take off. It's actually a very beautiful thing in full flower. This photograph 
gives you a small impression of the pinkishness that it gets, but uh, at its height, it can look quite impressive with pinky purple coloration. Um, this one, when it's not in flower, you would detect it by uh, the overall impression of the thing and by the feel of the leaves, which are extremely serrated. Um, this is uh, what it looks like in a paddock. I've got to move on. Um, there is the seed. The other thing as the acid test for identifying serrated tussock is that of all the nacellas, not all of them, but all the ones on your list, um, this one has the more or less turnip shaped um, head to the seed. Um, I'm going to skip over blue periwinkle fairly quickly because it's, I think, fairly easy to identify. Um, the, the ecology is that it doesn't rely much on seed. Uh, it spreads principally vegetatively, so keeping it in check is a main thing. Uh, you can use herbicides on it uh, to some effect, but it, it takes a while. Um, Pampas lily of the valley, I was a bit surprised to see that on the list. I don't think of it as being something that gets really out of control in Nilambic. Um, perhaps somebody could tell me where it really is starting to take off. I think of it as a real problem on um, uh, the coastline of Victoria, uh, but not so far inland as, uh, as Nilambic. Because I'm out of time, I'll leave you to ask questions in the question uh, phase, but um, uh, identification would be principally by these uh, cute little bell-shaped white flowers. Uh, the habit of the species is that it either, well, it scrambles over ground cover if, if it's on the ground, but given half a chance, it will scramble and climb up other uh, vegetation shrubs particularly. Um, that will have to do for that one, I think. Oh, look, Bulbul Watsonia, I reckon you already know what Bulbul Watsonia looks like and that the problem is the, the Bulbuls and it doesn't produce seed. Instead, it uses these Bulbuls on the stems. The only thing that you can confuse it with is Watsonia Bourbonica with its bright pink or white flowers, which is also a bit of a weed on roadsides, um, but not nearly as problematic as uh, Bulbul Watsonia. Um, skip over that. Um, and the last species on the list, in fact, it wasn't on the list, it was added on the bottom, is this Melaleuca hypericofolia, or red flowered uh, paperbark, I think is the common name that's being used. Um, I've seen this go uh, out of control in on the Mornington Peninsula at Balnaring. It does have some potential to do that, particularly in coastal areas. Um, I don't doubt that it, it or I'm not questioning whether it's become naturalised in Nilambic, but I think it's probably not a really high priority one, um, but then I haven't seen much of it, and maybe somebody can um, correct that impression. Um, and uh, let me see. Um, yeah, so on the Vic Flora site, it just says, native uh, Spreading from planted individuals into surrounding, often disturbed and weedy vegetation, which is telling you that uh, our more natural areas are probably not going to be affected. I've only ever seen it take off in quite modified environments. So if you know of it uh, being a, more of a problem in more intact native vegetation or elsewhere, let us know. And Hi, that will do. A, mm. a really quick comment on that one. I just put in a comment that Hyperica, uh, that um, Malaluca, sorry, is quite abundant in a few spots along the river opposite Pound Bend, so on the Nillambic side. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Kathy, do you regard it as uh, being in a weedy area or is it more threatening? Uh, no, more threatening, I think. It doesn't get huge and there's not huge numbers of it, but it's been there for a long time and it's spread. All right, I rate you highly as somebody who in who can interpret the behaviour of plants, not just say, oh yeah, there's that weed. Do you have you been able to formulate an idea of what it's relying on there and what potential it might have to take off? Um, it seems look, it seems to to like the river's edge and water, so I don't think it's going to spread far from the river, and I don't think it's going to take over the entire riverbank either. But it's definitely you know, more than a couple of plants. 
Well, that's very useful. Uh, I think everybody else would agree to know that um, it's something we need to keep our eye open for along the stream. Um, yeah. Uh, that's very useful practical information. Thanks, Kathy. Well, Ellie, um, I've gone over time, but I dealt with a few questions along the way. Does that absolve me? Of course, it's not a problem. So yeah, but we still have time for questions if anyone wants to say something now. Anyone? I'll perhaps stop um, sharing my screen so that we can see each other better. Yep. Um. Graham, it's Julia here. Hi, Julia. How are you going? Um, just a question with regards to DISA and the um, Fungal Association. Sorry, my dog's decided to bark while I'm talking. Um, <laughs> um, do you know much about, yeah, just the impact and the level of um, whether it's associating with the indigenous fungi to spread the seed or if it's an exotic one or what's happening in that sort of ground layer? Good question, Julia. I don't know. What I can say is that it turns up um, widespread uh, in the areas where it's had more than a couple of years of establishment. You're not really seeing it yet in our area. Give it another couple of years, then you'll see what I mean. Or head to South Australia, over to Western Victoria, and you'll see the situation. It turns up just everywhere. It's not as if it's relying on a particular sort of fungus. Um, it no doubt does rely on fungus, but you'd be aware that some uh, some species of even our native orchids, such as um, Microtus parva flora, one of the onion orchids, and uh, uh, a lot of the blue flowered thelemitras or sun orchids, will come up on bare clay that's been exposed on a, on a cutting or that sort of thing, where there can't be any significant um, uh, fungus to aid the plant. And I get the impression that the DISA is behaving that way because it just spreads so quickly um, if it relied on having a particular um, range of fungus species then I think it, its spread would be very much slower. Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly what fungus it's relying on. If it's uh, relying on the same fun fungus or fungi as uh, say a native orchid like Caledonia rosella, for example. I wonder whether it that's going to be a problem. Um, just thinking it through, the fungus has a symbiotic relationship with the orchid, and so if there was DISA there, and the fungus is aiding the orchid, then the orchid is also aiding the fung. Uh, sorry, if the fungus is getting into the South African orchid, then the fungus is getting some benefit and might then be able to uh, provide more benefit to the Caledonia rosella. I don't know. Uh, it's an interesting question, but um, I think the DISA is probably pretty um, agnostic about its uh, taste in fungi and might not even need much fungus. It, it, I'm really surprised that those thelemitras can turn up on um, bare subsoil without any fungus there or not not any appreciable fungus so i think it's more like that does that help julia yeah it does i guess it's just a, a thought about you know yeah like you said whether or not it's going to start you know taking resources from other orchids or potentially even um you know causing more common species to go um to become more threatened because it's taking away that resource so it's just a thought in terms of how we look at the management as well and prioritising areas, um, particularly like you said, how the those helimitras take over those, you know, kind of bare soil areas and the, um, the DICER sort of looks like it's doing something fairly similar in some places. So yeah, it's just keeping that in the back of our minds in terms of prioritisation. 
Well, Julia, you're you're good on the academic skills. Um, there's there's some homework for you. You can do a <laughs> bit of a literature search yep. um, and see who might be working on that, or yeah. perhaps somebody else in the audience now knows about some research on that. One thing I could mention is that in what is it, the week after next, there's yep. the annual, except for last year, annual uh, orchid conservation forum. And um, there will be people there who would know what's going on. I don't know whether you're going to that, Julia, but right. it, it, I, I will see if I can find out. But maybe you'd be able to find out too. Thanks. Anyone else? No? So thanks, Graham. We're ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, right. That's that's a really really great talk. Thank you so much. Um, so our, our next talk now. Um, for our next talk, I want to welcome um, Sally Lambert and Brad Matthews. They're from the Central Highlands Eden, which is an invasive species management project, and is part of the Weeds and Pests on Public Land program. So they will share uh, some of the, their experience in this project and how they're dealing with the emerging weeds there. So whenever you guys are ready. Uh, thanks, Ellie. And thanks to Graham, who's always very insightful. That's great. Um, so yeah, my name is Brad Matthews. I'm the project officer on the Central Highlands Eden project. Um, and I'm also joined by Sally, as you said, she's the project manager who you'll hear from a little bit later. Um, so we'll just give you a bit of an overview of our project and how we approach the management of early and beta weeds in the context of a landscape scale program. Um, we don't have too much um, species overlap um, in regards to weeds of the Nilambic area, but I think the prioritisation procedures are probably readily transferable. Um, I'll just share my screen. Can you see that okay? Okay, so operating since 2012, the Central Highlands Eden is the youngest of three Eden projects in Victoria, focused on the detection and removal of high risk weeds that threaten biodiversity values. Uh, the Eden projects being Central Highlands, Hotways and Glenelg, um, they all demonstrate a practical framework for implementing the Victorian government's biosecurity approach to weed management as outlined in the guidelines and procedures for managing environmental impacts of weeds, um, which is a really useful reference for setting up any weed management program. But rather than just focusing on single species, Eden projects take into account the effects and interactions of multiple weed species and the complex systems they occupy across the uh, entire landscape. So the project's located east of Melbourne in the Highland Southern Fall bioregion and covers around 400,000 hectares from the periurban fringe to West Gippsland. And this area was selected for its biodiversity values, in particular the large areas of relatively intact vegetation of varying ecological vegetation classes and the presence of threatened flora and fauna. So the project builds on the efforts of the Thompson Aberfeldy demonstration site or the TADS project that occupied the northeast quarter of the project um, a few years prior to the Eden being established. Initially, the project utilised the first iteration of the DELP Biodiversity Decision Support Tool NaturePrint uh, to identify the values in the landscape, which it wanted to protect, um, but also utilised local knowledge of land managers and some ground truthing. So this led to the development of biodiversity asset areas highlighted in orange here, um, where most of the weed control work is carried out. Currently, we're working in 20 of 24 asset areas. Nature kits 
Nature Prints Toolkit has been developed and updated over time and can be accessed through the Nature Kit website where it's added more tools over time, such as the Strategic Management Prospects tool, which among other things shows you where you might apply a particular on-ground action for the greatest cost benefit. And here you can see in the darkest shaded areas, um, this represents where you might get the greatest cost benefit for weed control. Now, some asset areas still align with the modelling, others not so much. We do review our asset areas each year, considering their alignment and taking into account the latest modelling. But that said, um, they've generally remained the same and due to logistics such as road alignments, um, access issues and other works that are already occurring in the project area. Now for the most part, land management split between Parks Victoria managing the national parks, state forests and other reserves and DELP managing primarily the state forest. However, land management in the area is a bit more complex than that. Um, and there's a wide range of land management agencies working in our space, um, including Melbourne Water, local government agencies, including Borbor and Yarra Ranges, Regional Roads Victoria, Alpine Resorts, SP Osnet, um, catchment management authorities, and some volunteer groups. So to ensure good project outcomes. Uh, we take a tenure bl blind approach to weed management and have successfully engaged most of these agencies as part of our project working group. So there are a few elements which increase the effectiveness of our project delivery, which starts with a working group, a very supportive and collaborative providing input into the adaptive management and the planning of the project, working with us to do our weed mapping, um, to coordinate contractors and treatment efforts. And they also undertake a, a large amount of complementary work in the project area. Uh, we also facilitate weed identification and management training tailored to the species and conditions of the project area. And we also provide weed stop vehicle hygiene training for agency staff and contractors who work within the project area to help them understand how vehicles and machinery can potentially be vectors for weed seeds and pathogens and ways to mitigate that risk. And we also have an experienced pool of contractors who have got the experience and the skills um, needed to deliver the environmentally sensitive works in the project area and they have an understanding of the project's aims and procedures and are familiar with the landscape and and all the challenges that go with it. So I'll hand over to Sally now. Um, she can give you a bit more of an overview on how we approach early invaders. Thanks, Brent. I'll try and share my screen now. Um, is that there for everyone to see? Yeah, it's just not full screen. Yep, it's good. Okay, so Brad's um, given an overview of how Central Highlands Eden um, operates. Um, so hopefully you can see how that overlaps or not with the Rivers to Ranges project. Um, we work across the full sort of continuum of the invasion curve, and I'm sure everyone's seen this um, in sort of one or other of its iterations that have sort of been around for a long time now. Um, the asset, um, biodiversity asset areas that Brad mentioned before, sort of that's sort of sitting on the right hand side, and we do work in those every year, but we are aware that if we can head further to the left, there's better bang for buck in terms of um, how we allocate our resources. So that weed stop or vehicle hygiene training that Brad mentioned is definitely sitting in that prevention um, column, but we do a lot of work in the eradication column as well. Um, 
Brad mentioned there's not a whole lot of overlap between our species list, um, but we'll look at our species, um, not their biology so much, but more the decision making processes we've gone through to um, focus in on what species we think we can eradicate. So even though it's kind of obvious, I've just included a couple of definitions here. So eradication is the elimination of every single individual, and that includes seeds or other propules of a species from a defined area. And for us, that area is the Central Highlands Eden, um, sort of 400,000 hectares, in which recolonisation is unlikely to occur. And that, in contrast to extirpation, which is sort of the localised extinction in a chosen geographic area. Um, and so for us, just a couple of examples, um, kiwi fruit is not an eradication target of ours. It's definitely an early invader. And it's known only from a handful of individual plants. Um, it's a dioecious species, so we know male and female plants that have to get in close enough proximity uh, before pollination can occur. And we've never found any evidence of fruiting plants. So all of that is favourable. It also has a long um, pre-reproductive period, so it takes several years before it matures. But we know there are at least four commercial or semi-commercial uh, uh, orchards sort of in the broader Gembrook area. So when we were talking about um, where recolonisation is unlikely to occur, for this species, we think that risk is too high. So even though it's an early invader, we see it as a containment target species. Blue stars is definitely another containment target species. There's three distinct populations, and you can see the one um, bottom right, I guess, is in Mundara State Park. It actually occupies about five kilometres of the Moy Rawson Road and adjoining easement. Um, it's an area that gets slashed each year, both in terms of roadside vegetation, but also under the power lines, the easement there. We know we can never eradicate the species across the whole project area, but the two other populations we have in Bunyip further west and just in the southern end of Bulbul National Park to the north. Um, you can see this slide shows our weed data just from the last 12 months. So Bunyip is largely restricted now. Um, overall, plants have been found scattered along about a kilometre of Bunyip River Road. It's still connected with the easement um, power lines coming across from Latrobe Valley. But in this instance, it's very much uh, scattered plants within about five or 10 metres of the formed road. It's a road within the state park, so not uh, the 100 kilometre hour main Moe Rawson Road that goes up through Moondara and a lot less traffic. Also, we're better able to work in with SB Osnet, who are aware of the infestation there and are happy to exclude it from slashing works for a few seasons to um, minimise the spread. And the, the other population near um, Borbor National Park, uh, even smaller again, wasn't mapped in the last 12 months. It's associated with a quarry and a section of about 300 metres of South Face Road. And again, it's working with contractors who do that um, roading, grading sort of work each year. So these are our eradication target species at present. And as far as I know, there's only one species overlap with the early invader list that Ali presented, which was the Patterson's Curse. Um, I've listed them here in order of um, extent mapped. So ginger lily, it's literally sort of two or four square metres, whereas Chinese wormwood um, is definitely more significant than that. I'll work through the scenario of of the species, but first to sort of cover off on some of the tools we've been using uh, in our decision making processes. So I'm sure most of you are aware of the WESI or the Weeds at the Early Stage of Invasion project, and they've developed a series of tools to assist in this space. So the advi advisory list of environmental weeds in Victoria is a few years old now, and it's meant to be a dynamic um, document. So they are in the process of resourcing that so it can be updated because over the last five years or four or five years or so 
uh, there's probably been, yeah, more weeds being introduced into Victoria that need to be considered, and maybe weeds that were considered in the past are presenting um, an increased risk. So the risk ratings provide sort of an indicative level of threat but posed by weeds, but at the state level. Um, so it's a statewide sort of rating. And expert opinion was sourced to rank, uh, provide a ranking score, and that included these attributes here. So I've listed our eradication target species along the bottom, uh, just providing an idea of where they sit in the ranking system. So more than half are considered high or very high. We do have some that are in that medium or lower potential scoring range. If resourcing was an issue, they might be ones we sort of dropped off the list. But for us at this end, um, there's very little resourcing involved. It's more a matter of um, monitoring mostly. Another tool from WESI is a series of six invasion guides. The one I was particularly interested for today was number five, Decide the Response. These guides have also been amalgamated into the Early Invader Manual, um, and all of these documents and the one previously can be found at the Invasive um, Species page for DELP. And the easiest way to find that is probably just type in Early Invaders into a Google search. Both manuals um, include a a feasibility of eradication score template. So it's Appendix J of the Early Invader Manual or Appendix 2 of the Decide the Response Manual. This template sort of looks through a number of factors associated with each weed species, both in terms of their extent and their biology. So for each species, you sort of work your way through the template and say gross area, for example, provides scores of zero for less than a hectare, two for two to two, 10 hectares, four for 10 to 100 hectares, um, and so on. And then there's sort of scorings for each of these characteristics. And as I said, it's available in both um, documents. So this is a selection of our weed species, um, and it's very much limited by the um, size of the screen. Uh, ideally, we'd be working pretty much solely in this left-hand side. So everything with a low score is has a greater feasibility of eradication. Um, but it is worth noting Taiwan lily came out with a score of 34. Uh, we still consider it feasible to eradicate, and I'll talk through the scenario of why sort of as, as we reach that one. So this very messy map represents the over 100,000 waypoints that we've collected uh, in the last decade for the project. Um, even taking out sort of blackberry and thistle species, there's still a lot there to digest. But with the attribute table data behind all this, we can definitely break down by time, um, date, species, geographic area, or other um, factors we need to to um, pull out data um, and give us, or assist us in our decision-making processes. So if we just pull out those species that we think we can eradicate, um, holly leaf barberry is only known from a single location at Jericho, which is an old mining site. Um, as I said, single site, we were alerted to this one by Melbourne Water staff who were doing water quality assessment up at the dam there. Um, we are aware because of the mining um, history to it that there are exotic vegetation planted that are considered to have that heritage value. So there's oak trees and there's also bulbs and other similar exotic plants around the cemetery. So we assessed the, the area more broadly um, and decided that the holly leaf barberry was definitely spreading, whereas most of the other species um, we were happy to leave. Um, have treated this first couple of years, and then it's just been a matter of monitoring. Um, we sort of go in every second year. Last time I went in, uh, there was just a single plant that was hand pulled. So it's it's a matter of um, keep monitoring for now, um, but we think we're we're getting close. Fishbone fern, just known from Hunter Road in 
Mundara State Park, which is our very southern edge, both of the um, park itself, but also of the broader project area. And again, we've got lots of messy um, data, but we can just pull out the location for the fishbone fern, but also other species of concern along this road. So fishbone fern was one of the ones that is definitely a low scoring one um, in the advisory list, but we've kept it as an eradication target because um, first few years treated and it hasn't been seen since. So it's definitely not using resources and it's just one of our monitor species. And we come to this road each year um, to tackle these, these weeds. So the fishbone fern, agapanthus, blue periwinkle, freesia and inkweed are no longer mapped along this section of road. Um, Dolichus pea and jasmine, there was one individual plant of each species found last season. Roldana, again, only known from one site. Uh, there was maybe six or eight individual plants that were noted uh, after a plan burn. So Erica's staff, which are located nearby, um, we're monitoring the site anyway, and we'll continue to monitor the site both in terms of um, weed control efforts. So they undertake the weed control and monitor. Um, so it's not one we're directly resourcing ourselves, but we're working with the staff there. Himalayan strawberry tree, so two sites. Originally, sort of the first um, few years, it was just known from the Maroonie catchment um, up near Hillsville, but the Wellhalla site was mapped more recently and it's kind of thrown a bit of a spanner in the works. There's a planning scheme overlay in Wellhalla, again associated with the mining and the history of the area that actually protects the exotic trees or most, well, much of the exotic trees there. So if we were to pursue removal of the, the strawberry tree there, it would only be um, after sort of an engagement process with locals and council. So this one um, might be better as a containment species where we can look to extirpation uh, in Maroondah um, and just making sure that there's no spread from Walhalla, but otherwise just maintain um, that site as is for now. Taiwan Lily, this is the one that scored um, 34 on the feasibility of eradication score. So compared to all the other species, it's got very highly and probably wouldn't necessarily be advised uh, as an eradication target, but um, just the, the situation we're in, we think we can achieve it. So the first couple of years, it was just known from our Limberlost asset area. So map treated and then in the next few years, wasn't seen at all. Um, then our Britannia Creek asset area was mapped uh, more recently, uh, first year here, there were 17 individual plants that were all hand pulled while we were mapping. It has come back um, in subsequent years, but only a handful of plants. Uh, our third site out at Tangil Bren, this was actually mapped and removed when it was juvenile and hadn't um, flowered. So when I was in last season, and it was a bit later in the year, and actually saw it in flower, it was actually ended up being tiger lily. So a related species um, that looks similar as a juvenile plant, but um, that then removes for us one of the, the three populations. Um, and Limbolost, as I said, haven't seen for years. So we're just down to that single population for, for this species now. Dolichus pea, it's known from two sites. I mentioned it before when we were talking about Hunter Road in Mundara. Our other site is along the Black Spur. So we've got a couple of sites here and uh, it's very difficult in terms of um, mapping and treating um, along Black Spur. Um, we have been able to piggyback on um, Department of Transport or Vic Roads works where they were doing dangerous tree removal. So they had traffic management in place. So at the same time, we were able to um, coordinate with them uh, mapping and weed treatment at the same time. So that was fantastic that year, but it's not something we've been able to do every year. And we're not necessarily as confident here that we're mapping every single plant 
um, and getting treatment of every single plant every year. So this last season, Brad went in and just um, treated the known um, Dolichus pea sites. Blue Seralia, it's known just from Moondara. There were two sites in there. Similar to the Blue Stars, one of those sites is along the Murray Rawson Road that gets slashed annually. So we try and get in early enough to treat the weed before the slashing, um, but we're not always successful. But we found that the slashing, because they get in so early in the season, they tend to be slashing the plant before it has any chance of setting seed. And this one only disperses via seed. So we're not seeing any spread, but we're just not confident that we're killing every plant. And the second site, which is further off the road, um, after that first season of map and treat, we haven't seen it at that location since. Haddison's Curse, this is the one area of overlap we've got. Um, for us, it's known just from a single site. So at the Thompson Dam. So this is the Thompson Dam wall um, sort of picnic area and viewing area. We've been mapping and treating up here for years mainly because in the Board of Works days, they planted out bluebell creeper and rosemary, rosemary grevillea, so non-Indigenous native species that um, were definitely spreading. And there was just a handful of other things like the inkweed, a bit of blackberry and other bits and pieces that were mapped too. Uh, when I went out oh, four years ago now, there was a whole bunch of Patterson Curse just popping up. Um, before I'd even finished mapping it, um, Joel from Melbourne Water was following along behind me and treating it. So um, the next year, so second year, we were down to two plants, I think. Then in 1920, no plants at all. Although I went out last year and found um, just two more waypoints, but you can see they're sort of in that yellow area rather than the green. So they're actually beyond the public access area and I just hadn't noted them the year previous, but I got the key this time to get access. Um, and so they're back on our list for, well, they, they've been treated, but back on our list to monitor and, and see what pops up next season. Banana passion fruit, known from two sites near Erica. One of them associated with a plantation that's in the process now of being um, logged. So we'll see what that disturbance nearby does and what impact that has. Um, we were down to pretty much a single plant there. The other site's a little bit more complicated because it's on the road into Walhalla. So there's a, a steep drop off for those that know that road in. Uh, so it's a matter of making sure we can keep contractors safe doing works, but also um, trying to map and sort of look over the embankment to where other um, plants might be. Um, just adds a little bit more complexity to, to this species. Sticky Bartsia is probably getting a little bit more complex again. Um, we've got an area in the centre here which is actually associated with the pine plantation. And in terms of the, the management of weeds in the plantation, um, it's really anything that impacts on the growth of the pine trees rather than um, the environmental weeds we'd like prioritised. Um, but if we focus in on this other section, the top of the Thompson Dam, um, this is what we call our Asset E site. And several years ago, we noted about 200 metres of scattered plants on the Whitelaw Weir track. Um, we consider this low risk though, because it's a track that's really just designed to get access to Melbourne Water infrastructure. So it sits behind a lock gate year round. Um, we treated the first year, Melbourne Water um, was also shared um, the data and they've also been treating since. But this is an area we've had trouble getting into in recent years. Um, the fire, the Thompson fire um, was here a few years ago. And then in the last two seasons, there's the, a bridge across the Thompson River that's had um, been rebuilt. And so we've we've struggled to get access. We sort of came in from the east and the north, but we, we've kind of missed this middle and, and haven't been able to access this track again. So the mapping I was able to last year revealed three 
very small populations. Um, but the fact that we can't get in the middle um, is some concern as to um, whether there's additional plants in there and we'll have to sort of look at how much um, of that spread may have been associated with the, the ongoing works there. So the last few species I wanted to look at are the ones that occur um, in higher sort of meter squared sort of range and also um, some of them higher numbers of populations as well. So aluminium plant, um, even though it seems sort of we had five or six populations, most of those were along the Donabuing Road. Um, so we thought that even though it was fairly widespread, they weren't huge, any one of them in isolation, um, and that stayed an eradication target for several years, um, mainly because the literature suggests that it doesn't set seed in Australia. So we thought if it was just fire, um, vegetative reproduction that we had some hope of getting in. And we actually had multiple treatments um, in a year as well. But in recent years, we've had two new um, infestations to consider. So it's probably one that we'd have to revise the feasibility eradication score and other factors to really um, consider whether this one is retained as an eradication target or whether it's too widespread now and should be more a containment option only with possible extirpation of those outlier populations. Polygala. It is only known from one site, um, but it is right on the banks of the Maroondah Reservoir, is obviously drinking water. So we've been hand pulling here. Um, and again, this dates back to the Board of Works days where they actively planted it. Uh, on the approach down to the, the reservoir. So in the absence of herbicide, um, we will hopefully get on top of this. Uh, it doesn't seem to have spread very far, but again, it's just adding a, a layer of complexity, I guess. And the final one that we wanted to consider was Chinese wormwood. So this is the Tanjil Bren site. And for us, Tanjil Bren, pretty much sitting in the middle of our project area, is a um, it and Walhalla, I guess, are the two weediest spots that we have to deal with. Um, Tangle Bren, sorry, um, Chinese wormwood isn't, well, it's got that one small side up, it's black spur, but it's, it's otherwise it's contained here, but it is on several roads radiating out from Tangle Bren. Um, but we are hopeful, I guess, because the, the last mapping data from this season just gone, um, shows a much reduced infestation. So still hopeful um, that eradication is feasible here, but like all the other species, we go through annually and review all the data, um, go through that feasibility score again and, and see where we're placed in terms of resourcing and time to deal with all these things. So that's it from me. Um, yeah, I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Thanks Ali. Ali. Uh, sorry, guys, I lost my internet connection for a few minutes now. But uh, so I, I'm using my phone now. So maybe uh, if, if I lost again, so that's that's a problem. I'll try to, to reconnect it. Um, so any questions for for Brad and, and Sally? Nope. I have one. So. Um, Guys, thanks so much for for presenting, uh, for talking about about the project. Uh, it's it's incredible to see like how much work, uh, how much you have work on this. Um, so I think my question is about, it's more about like the how, how do how do you keep tracking of those of those infections because for each each species is different. So um, you have like species with uh, seed banks that last much longer than, than other species. So do, do you have like a specific plan to keep track of those of those infestations? Like, for example, for, for this species, I, I maybe I don't have to, to go every year to, to check on them. So maybe they're, they're, they, they are not, they don't have the potential to, to spread uh, so fast. But for this other one, I might have to, to go like 
and look for them every year or something like that? Do you have a do you have uh, like a plan for this? Um, with the, another WESI tool, they did create an eradication um, template, an eradication plan template, and we adapt that as well for our containment species. Um, I guess we've got all that data sitting there together in a big spreadsheet, but we also pull out those species of concern or those species where we think we can have um, the most success. Um, and we sort of, yeah, so we've got sort of different strategies and there's sort of an overarching implementation plan that um, we work to each season as well. Do you want to add anything, Brad? Um, oh, just that, you know, um, annually we go through um, each of those asset areas and map the road network within, um, which keeps on top of those weed species. But I guess one failing there can be timing, which um, at a certain time of year you won't see Taiwan lily, which could be one of the complications we've had there. Um, and sometimes there's different access issues like fire or uh, COVID, which throw up barriers to what we're trying to do. Thanks. Does anyone else have questions for them? Or general questions at all? <laughs> uh, is, is there is there any other species that did you guys want to want to add to the list? Like, oh, oh sorry. So Michelle is asking something here. Uh, so she's asking, uh, what do you do if you notice uh, a weed which is not declared noxious or is not a wesi, etc., etc., but is discussed as being an issue? Unless she's thinking about Galenia in particular. I guess from an Eden perspective, because we're weed mapping every year, um, we can sort of look back on our collated data and see change over time. If we mapped something as just one or two plants one year, and then we sort of really suddenly realised two years later that it's, you know, spread 100 metres down the road or something, that I guess helps us in our decision making process. But we also do look at that threat level of each species as well, I guess. Mm. Cool. So yeah, she's saying that, that that's a lot. There's a, a lot of uh, galenia along the edge of Plant Gorge, and also there's also a massive issue in Blackwood. Someone from is there? Someone from Plant Gorge that wants to to give a word about this? I guess just to give some background to it, when I was working at Morrible and I was involved in the land care network. Um, it was a massive issue for land care, um, particularly in the Blackwood area. And I just noticed it, I don't know if it's spreading, but um, I think it was introduced as a, mm, a stabilising uh, ground cover uh, along roadsides. Um, but I know, yeah, the mm, southern edge of Plenty Gorge, um, where it goes into the council land, it's everywhere and clearly smothers everything. It's in degraded areas, so maybe it's just cre creating some ground cover, but I worry or I wonder whether it can spread into uh, more important parts of the gorge or just other areas in general. No one ever mentions it, so I'm just querying whether anyone knows about it or has any opinion on it locally. Um, I, I'm quite familiar with blanket weed or Galenia pubescens. Um, yes. it's, it is a huge problem on basalt uh, in the Melbourne region generally. I've never seen it do anything on the sediments. I see a little bit of it, you know, within a kilometre of the basalt, but I've never really seen it establish or do anything like on the basalt, which is not to say it isn't a serious problem in Nillambic on the basalt and around the Plenty River in particular, but um, it, it, it is a, a well and long recognised problem Mm. Uh, and it is tricky to deal with, but it's not a problem throughout the whole of Nillambic. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Any more questions? For Sally or Brad's or or Grammy. Oh, 
or oh, another question. <laughs> so, um, but well, uh, I, I want to thank everyone first uh, for for joining here, for joining us today. Um, and well, I I, th I think. Uh, we we, ha we have a lot of of information about like this this emerging weeds um, in, in our project areas. Uh, I've been putting together um, in, in this in this document slow, so we're trying to to move forward in this uh, management plan. So, but I, I think like what what we we need most now is probably um, to work better on, on on the mapping so like to, to actually know where our infestations are now so I'll, I'll, I'll send around this this list so grandma show show the list and I also have like um, this this more extensive uh, information about uh, where it was mapped in in the past in the, in the past year so we can also uh, add more uh, information to that and then we can move forward to actually like define what uh, would be our priorities um in in the future in the future of the project um but is, is someone wants to wants to give a comment about that or i don't know it's someone wanted to say about it, something about it no So guys, so uh, I think we're, we're going to end a bit early. So if that's all right for everyone. All good. Can I Sorry. Lots of info overload. <laughs> yep, yeah, it is. I'm trying to put it all together. So I'm, I'm also sending around my notes probably. Uh, and, and also the, the recording of the of the workshop. So I think everyone can go through it again and I don't know. <laughs> well, so thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for organizing, Ellie. Thanks, Ellie. You're more than welcome, guys. <laughs>